Epiphany of Truth TV. Hello and welcome to Epiphany of Truth TV. Today we're going to go over Christmas. That's right, it's that time of year to be called a pagan. It's that time of year to say that we stole December 25th from the winter solstice, or that we stole it from Nimrod, or that we stole it from Mithra, or that it's actually the unconquered sun, Sol Invictus. But are any of these things true? Well, today we're going to get into that. We're going to go over some of the myths, we're going to go over what the Bible says, and we're going to go over some of the history, including the Dead Sea Scrolls. So let's get started. Let's go over birthdays. Let's start with Mithra. Now Mithra is an old Persian god. There's a lot of writings about it. Here's from Wikipedia page. Mithra goes all the way back to 1500 BC or greater. There's a problem. That version of Mithra is very different than the Mithra that we're told about that is born on December 25th. But where does that one come from? Well, let's hop over here to the Cy Encyclopedia Britannica. It says that there is little notice of the Persian god in the Roman world until the beginning of the 2nd century, but from the year 136 CE, which is AD, there are hundreds of inscriptions to Mithra. This renewal of interest is not easily explained. The most plausible hypothesis seems to be that the Roman Mithraism was practically a new creation wrought by a religious genius who may have lived as late as 100 AD and who gave old tradition Persian ceremonies a new Platonic interpretation that enabled Mithraism to become acceptable in the Roman world. This is from Encyclopedia Britannica. Now the earliest mention that we have of Christmas is 115 AD, which means that it was going on before that. Now with Christmas being very popular in the Roman world and with that growing and getting more traction, it was very, very, very plausible and likely to move the Roman version of Mithra to December 25th and make him more of a Jesus type character. The character before was not born on December 25th and has nothing in common whatsoever. So to clarify, who they said was the genius that started to reform and rebuild Mithra into a Roman character they said lived as late as 100 AD. However, there's no inscriptions to Mithra until 136 AD. So although it's theorized that that person lived before that, there was no inscriptions until 136 AD that said that Mithra was born on December 25th. Which means that the earliest writings that we have with Mithra born on December 25th is after the writings that we have that say that Jesus was born on December 25th. Next we have Sol Invictus, and this is probably the most popular one to say that Christmas is modeled after. Now, cults of Sol have lasted a long time, and they were long beforehand. Now, as we read, the traditional Feast of Days of Sol, as recorded in the earliest imperial fasti, were August 8th and or August 9th. Now, they had other rituals that were on August 28th and December 11th. This was from Hegemans, page 588. Now, when did this change? Well, first, we're going to have to go over some inscriptions here. Now, an inscription of AD 102 restores a restoration of the portico of Saul. So once again, that we know that at least 102, Saul existed. And we'll see right here that scholars have sometimes regarded the traditional Saul and Saul Invictus to be two separate deities. And we see here the earliest extent dated with the inscription that uses Invictus as its epithet of Saul is from the AD 158. Saul Invictus played a prominent role in the Mithraic mysteries and was equated with Mithra. Now, we've already gone over that Mithra was made after the fact. So here we have some major changes that came along after. So when did Sol Invictus be celebrated on December 25th? Well, the first thing we need to do is we need to look at Helu Gabalus. Now he is the one that restored Sol, and he's also the one that pushed for Sol Invictus. However, Sol Invictus was not practiced on December 25th until 274 by decree of Aurelian. On December 25th of that year, he consecrated a temple dedicated to the cult of Sol Invictus. So this is 274. 274 not only comes after Mithra, which we know that this is modeled after, but it also comes after what we already know was celebrated as the birth of Jesus on December 25th, which is 115 AD. Saul Invictus is out. I know a lot of people like to claim that Christianity, or at least Christmas, is based off of Saul Invictus. Saul Invictus clearly comes much, much later. And not only did it come much later, it came by Roman decree. Now let's talk about Dionysus. He is said to be the same type of character as Jesus. Now, we know that Dionysus was being worshipped long before the Bible was compiled. However, nothing in the old days says that he had a birthday of December 25th. This comes from what is called the Orpheus Amulet, which is claimed to be from 300 AD, which is, once again, afterwards. But it turned out it was a 20th century forgery. There is absolutely no factual evidence that Dionysus was born on December 25th, and the only thing that they have pointing towards that is something that's a forgery from the 20th century. Now let's talk about Krishna. Krishna is said to have a birthday on December 25th. Well, in Hinduism, Krishna is believed to be the eighth avatar of Vishnu, the second aspect of the Hindu trinity. 
Almost every correlation between Krishna and Jesus can be traced to Kirsty Graves, a 19th century author who believed, or at least taught, that Christianity was created from pagan myths. Though his works have been proven by scholars to be false and poorly researched, many still refer to his arguments not knowing that they're easily disproven by simply comparing the Bible to the Hindu text. Again, there is no pre-Christian manuscript or evidence of this. In fact, there's no pre-19th century manuscript or evidence of this. But what about Horace, right? Horace is definitely one that was on December 25th. Actually, no. According to Egyptian mythological history, Horace's birthday is celebrated in the season of Koyak, which runs on the months of October and November, not December and not December 25th. Then we have Attis. Attis is said to be very, very similar. However, when you actually read Greek mythology, you'll find that he's very, very different. There's people that say that the birth of Attis is very similar to Jesus, the fact that his parents did not have sexual intercourse. However, the myths have less to do with each other as you would think. Attis was conceived not by sexual intercourse, but taking fruit from an almond tree that had grown up from the sexual organ of Ischistius, which the god had cut off. Obviously, that's nothing like Jesus. But what about December 25th? We hear that a lot. We hear that Attis is another one that might be on the December 25th. Once again, absolutely nothing to affirm that. There's no records. There's no anything pre the 19th century in this case. However, even if there was, almost everything that we have from Attis comes from a man whose name I cannot pronounce. Pausanias? All right, Pausanias. He was a Greek traveler and geographer of the 2nd century AD. He was born 110 AD and he died 180 AD and wrote down everything about the Attis cult towards the end of his life, once again after 115 AD. Next up, we have Nimrod, which we actually know very, very little about. People have kind of superimposed everyone else's religion, or they've superimposed him as Satan, or they've superimposed him as Mithras, or they've superimposed him as Dionysus, or they've superimposed him as all different other things. But really, what we have of Nimrod can fit in one page. There's no mention of his birthday. There's no celebrations of him in December. Nearly everything that we have is from 19th and 20th centuries, those of which who have already mentioned, who are trying to say that the Bible is copied from old pagan myths. The problem is, is it's not, and it's clear as day. There is absolutely nothing that anyone can show you that shows a birthday of Nimrod. People will make the statement all the time, they will make the claim all the time, and they cannot show any evidence to prove it because there is none. So that means that Nimrod is out. It's just not true. You see, there was a lot of atheists in the 19th and 20th century, and even a lot of Christians that were trying to go back to Hebraic roots. Now, the problem with the Hebrew roots movement is that it must reject everything after Babylon. So the idea was to try to find as many similarities as they could so that they could deny anything past Babylon, which also includes Jesus and the entire New Testament, and even the Deuterocanical books. It's typically assumed that when similarities are found between Christianity and other religion, now it doesn't matter what type of similarity, that the flow of influence is into Christianity. However, when you research the original versions of these things, you will find that the truth is always the other way around. The secret is that Christianity was written first and everything else was modeled after that because of how popular it was. As Christianity grew, they realized that other things had to be changed. For example, the term Yule. A lot of people will mention that December 25th is actually the season of Yule. Well, the first time Yule is mentioned is in 1475. That's right, a lot of people don't realize that Nordic mythology was actually put in Eddas during the 800s and on, and it wasn't written down until the 1400s. So almost everything Nordic is based on Christianity and not the other way around. Why are there similarities between Odin or between... Thor, well, it's quite simple, because they were written after the fact. So what about the winter solstice? Well, the winter solstice is December 17th through the 23rd, depending on region, time period, all of that. The winter solstice is not on December 25th. This year, in 2018, the winter solstice is going to be in December 21st. The only time that you will see the winter solstice on December 25th is on a website or from a person who's claiming that Jesus was born during the winter solstice. The claim is made that the holiday was put in place to overwrite what was already there. Well, let's take Halloween, for example. Let's say that I wanted to make a holiday that overwrites Halloween, but I didn't want to actually put it on the day of Halloween, so instead I put it on the 29th. The end result is people would celebrate yours on the 29th, and then they would celebrate Halloween on the 31st. That is why it makes absolutely no sense to put something around the day. The only way it makes sense is to put it on the day itself, and it is not on that day. The claim that it's the winter solstice, or it's the day after the winter solstice, which it is not, doesn't hold any water whatsoever. Once again, a false claim. As we're seeing, there's so many false claims about this that you have to wonder about why people are making these false claims. They obviously are either A, 
completely fabricating everything and lying to you, or B, they're getting their information from a single source or from another source that has fabricated things. Because these things absolutely do not exist, and yet they are taught to people as fact today. So what does the Bible say? Well, let's start in Jeremiah 10, 3. For the customs of the people are in vain, for one cutteth a tree out of the forest, the work of the hands of the workmen, with an axe. They deck it with silver and gold, they fasten it with nails and with hammers, that it move not. They are upright as a palm tree, but they speak not. They must needs be born, because they cannot go. Be not afraid of them, for they cannot do evil, neither also is it in them to do good. Now offhand, that sounds like it could possibly be what's referred to as the Christmas tree. But let's check something else out really quick. Here in Second Chronicles 3, 5, we see, In the greater house he sealed with fir tree, which he overlaid with fine gold, and set thereon palm trees and chains. And he garnished the house with precious stones for beauty, and the gold was gold of Parvaim. He overlaid also the house, the beams, the posts, and the walls thereof, and the doors thereof with gold, and graved cherubims on the walls. And he made the most holy house, the length whereof was according to the breadth of the house twenty cubits, and the breadth thereof twenty cubits. And he overlaid it with fine gold, amounting to six hundred talents. And the weight of the nails was fifty shekels of gold, and he overlaid the upper chambers with gold. And in the most holy house he made two cherubims of image work, and overlaid them with gold. Now here in Second Chronicles 3, 5, we have what the angels, which is directly told from God, on how Solomon needed to build the temple. Well, we find something very interesting in here. If what it's referring to in Jeremiah 10 is taking wood, chiseling it, the work of the craftsman with the axe, that's how the actual translation looks too. It's to work it with a chisel or to form it. Well, here they formed it into planks, and those planks were nailed in place. They were decked with silver and gold, that actually gets into the silver a little bit later on. But this is good enough for right now. They decked it with silver and gold. They put cherubims, carved imagery, and it even says two cherubims of image work. All of these things were part of the temple, in particular the second temple of God. So is the second temple of God pagan? Well, now you have to answer yourself that, because this is a very serious thing here. If Jeremiah 10 is referring to, as this is said, this right here makes the second temple of God pagan. Or let's take another point here. A point that I made when I debated somebody not too long ago, about a week ago. He made the point that the Christmas tree was cut out of the forest, and it was brought in, it was nailed down to a stand, and then they decorated it. Well, he's partially right in this with the fact that Second Chronicles 3 and the decorations that we use for the Christmas tree are identical. And that's because the tree is a representation of the tree of life. Now that I'll get to later on in the video. However, Jeremiah 10 is referencing carving an idol. You'll notice that it says that it cannot walk, it cannot speak. Well, that's because it has legs, but it can't walk. It's got hands, but it can't grab, and it's got lips, but it can't speak. It can't do anything because it's just a carved idol. What nobody seems to be able to answer when I ask them is, what image is the Christmas tree carved into? Do you know? Well, it isn't carved into any image. It's the image of itself. When people make that claim, I always get them, and the way I always get them is I just repeatedly ask, which image is the Christmas tree carved into? Is it an image where it has feet or legs where it can walk? Is it imagery where it has lips or a mouth where it could speak? Because in Jeremiah 10, that's exactly what it's referring to. So why do we use a Christmas tree? Well, obviously, as we've already seen, the decorations come from the second temple. So why use a tree? Well, in Revelation 22:14 we see, Blessed are those who wash their robes, that they may have the right to the tree of life, and may enter by the gates into the city. Well, in Revelation 7, 14, we find, And they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So the people that are blessed who have washed their robes that have access to the tree of life are those who come to Jesus and are cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. Now, in Revelation 22, 1 through 3, we find, and he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and from the Lamb, in the middle of its street. And on either side of the river was the tree of life, bearing twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations, and there shall no longer be any curse. In Revelation 2.17 we find, To he who overcomes I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. So what we're seeing is, the tree of life is a reward, but what kind of reward is it? Well, let's look in Isaiah. In Isaiah 55, 13, we find, Instead of the thorn shall come up the fir tree, and instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree. 
and it shall be to the Lord for a name, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. The tree, in particular, is a representation of the tree of life, which is the gift of God. It represents the new covenant, the everlasting covenant. But why are we decorating a tree like the second temple? Well, what does December 25th have to do anything with the second temple? Funny you should ask that. Now, before we can answer that question, let's look at the word oren. Now, oren, the definition is a fir tree. Now, this is used in a very strange way. This oren is a fir tree, and it references a descendant of Judah. Jesus is a descendant of Judah. Now, you can ask yourself, why is a fir tree referenced to a descendant of Judah? Well, I think it should all start to make sense right now, that the fir tree is a representation of Jesus. The tree of life is also a representation of Jesus. All of these things are representations of Jesus in order to get us to understand exactly what he and who he is. Now let's start putting a few things together. Now Jesus is the third temple. He is the temple of God. In Colossians 2.9 we find, For in him dwelleth all of the fullness of the Godhead bodily. We also find in John 2.19, Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And he's referring to himself there. In Acts 7.48, we find, Howbeit the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands, as saith the prophet. Because that's actually a lot of places. I mean, if I could actually list them all, but once is enough. The truth is, is that Jesus is the temple of the Father. He is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. He is the third temple. Now, how does this all fit together? Well, it's actually very simple. But before we get to that, let's look at one last thing. In John 8.12, we see, when spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of this world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. So now we're seeing that Jesus is the light. That's important. Let's put all these together. Now, as you know from a prior video, the Deuterocanon was in the Bible all the way up to the late 1800s. Now, we would know all of this if that book hadn't been removed. In particular, the book 2 Maccabees. Here at 2 Maccabees 10 we can see the rededication of the temple. Now this is very important because this explains a lot of the rituals and everything that Jews follow. Okay, it says in verse 5 that they rededicated the temple on the 25th day of the month of Kislev, the same day of the same month on which the temple had been desecrated by the Gentiles. The happy celebration lasted eight days, like the festival of shelters, and the people remembered how only a short time before that they had spent the festival of shelters wandering like wild animals in the mountains and living in caves. But now, carrying green palm branches and sticks decorated with ivory, they paraded around singing grateful praises to him who had brought about the purification of his own temple. Everyone agreed that the entire Jewish nation should celebrate this festival each year. This is very important. This is where Hanukkah comes from. In particular, after this event, December 25th or Kislev 25th, depending on which calendar you're using. If you're using the Babylonian slash Hebrew calendar, it's Kislev 25th. If you're using the Roman calendar, it's December 25th. On that day, the first day of Hanukkah is the Feast of Dedications, in which you have a feast to dedicate the second temple. This kicks off Hanukkah, which is called the Festival of Lights. So your Kislev slash December 25th, that day is the Feast of Dedications. Okay, so in 3 BC, when Jesus was born, those two months merged. Every about eight years or so, because of the way that the calendars are slightly off, the two calendars merged together. Jesus was born on a day of unification. He was born on the day where the month of Kislev and the month of December matched together. He was born on the 25th when both calendars united. Boy, that says a lot about Jesus, because that explains why he came. He came to unify everyone together. He came for his lost sheep, which is Israel, in particular Judah. And then later, for the Gentiles, he came to unify everybody under the body of Christ. So this is very, very, very important to find out. This is extremely awesome to see, because now we have a reason why he's born on 25th. But is there anything to back that up? Well, let's look at what the Bible has to say. The Bible says that Gabriel appeared to Zacharias while on temple duty, and that's in Luke uh, one eight. Gabriel appealed to Zacharias to tell him that he was going to have a baby. Immediately after his return, Elizabeth became pregnant. That's in Luke 1, 23 and 24. 
Gabriel appeared to Mary in the sixth month after John's conception. That's Luke 1.26. Here's where most people play the game. They show this, and then they say, well, we know that Zacharias was doing this, or we know that Zacharias was doing that. And that way they can move the, the days around. But the problem is, is that they don't know that. The Bible itself doesn't actually say what service that he was in. But we can look at a few other things. We know that the priests were divided into 24 courses. They served for one week at a time from Sabbath to Sabbath. That's from 2 Chronicles 23, 8, 24, 7 through 19. There were three weeks of the year when all of the courses were on duty. That's Passover, Pentecost, and the Tabernacles. What happens when we go through it that way? We know from Josephus that the first division, the division of Jehoiarib, was on duty when Jerusalem was besieged during the first week of April, A.D. 70, so during the siege of the, the temple. We know that the priestly course of Abias, which is the Greek version of Abijah, is the family from Zacharias. Now, the early church fathers said that he was serving during the second week of the Jewish month of Tashiri, during the very day of the Day of Atonement, which is the tenth day of Tashiri. Now, in our calendar, the Day of Atonement would land anywhere from September 22nd to October 8th. This is what the earliest church fathers said. Now, in 4 BC, the Day of Atonement fell on a Monday, October 1st. The following week was Tabernacles, so Zechariah could not return home to Elizabeth for another two Sabbaths. That means he left Jerusalem, perhaps a Sunday, October 14th. This means that even if we cannot prove that Zechariah was serving during the first week of October 4th BC, he definitely would have been serving, along with the other 23 courses, during the second week of October. And he would not have gotten home until after that. So let's assume, for a second, that John was conceived within one week of Zechariah's return. That would therefore have been mid-October, with the Annunciation following some 26 weeks later, around mid-April, 3 BC. This puts the birth of Jesus at 38 weeks at the end of December or early January. Now that sounds familiar, doesn't it? Now, this is assuming, by the way. This is assuming that that's correct. But we actually have verifiable proof that that is correct. As far back as 1957, all the way up to 1995, Jerusalem scholar Shiramayahu Talman published an in-depth study on the calendar of the Qumran sect. It's based in part on parchment number 321, fourth quarter, 321 of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now he reconstructed the entire temple system. He also reconstructed without a shadow of a doubt, the order of the sacerdotal rota system. So here's what he wrote. Here the family of Abijah, of which Zechariah was a descendant, father of John the Baptist, was required to officiate twice a year, on the days 8 through 14th of the third month and on the days 24 through the 30th of the eighth month. This latter period fell at the end of September. It is not without reason that the Byzantine calendar celebrated John's conception on the September 23rd and his birth nine months later on June 24th, the sixth month after Annunciation, established as a litur liturgical feast on March 25th, comes three months after the forerunner's birth, preluded to the ninth month in December. Thus December 25th has reason, through the Dead Sea Scrolls, which we found recently, that it actually is the historical date of the birth of Jesus. So the Dead Sea Scrolls actually attest to this, and that's the best part of all this, is the fact that we have things from back then, telling us exactly what the priestly duties were. Therefore, we actually do have a point that we can nail down. Now, of course, it is not from the Bible as we know it. It's from extra-biblical sources. However, it is through two different ways we can narrow this down. The first way is through the Dead Sea Scrolls. The second way is to look at what the early church fathers said. In the words of Theophilus, as early as 115 AD, Catholic Bishop of the Caesarea in Palestine, we ought to celebrate the birthday of our Lord on which day soever the 25th of December shall happen. Further testimony reveals that the Church Fathers claimed December 25th as the birthday of Christ prior to the conversion of Constantine in the Roman Empire. The earliest record of this is Pope Telesphorus, who reigned 126 to 137 AD. He instituted the tradition of Midnight Mass on Christmas Eve. Although the Liber Pontificalis does not give us the date of Christmas, it assumes that the Pope was already celebrating Christmas and that Mass at Midnight was added. Shortly after, in the second century, Hippopolitus, which is 170 to 240 AD, he wrote in passing that the birth of Christ occurred on December 25th. Quote, the first advent of our Lord in the flesh occurred when he was born in Bethlehem, it was December 25th, a Wednesday, while Augustus was in his 42nd year, which is 5,500 years from Adam. He suffered in the 33rd year, March 25th, Friday, the 18th year of Tiberius Caesar, while Rufus and Rebellion were consuls. Now, as you see, this is way back there. This is much further than most people will admit that people were celebrating December 25th as Jesus' birthday. Now, you'll notice one thing I didn't bring up was Saturnalia, and the reason is that Saturnalia is the celebration 
of the winter solstice, and I've already covered the winter solstice. Because the winter solstice is a totally different time, Saturnalia is totally different. I didn't include that in this video. Saturnalia is a day where you wear different hats and where master and servant change places. It's a festival that lasts a couple days. Once again, it has nothing to do with Christmas. It has nothing to do with Hanukkah. Let's look at something else here, though. If Kislev 25th or December 25th, which is the Feast of Dedications, is bad, why did Jesus actually go to the temple during that day? John 10, 22 and 23, And it was at Jerusalem, the Feast of the Dedication, and it was winter. And Jesus walked into the temple in Solomon's porch. And immediately he was confronted by all the Jews who were celebrating during that time. However, Jesus actually went and observed this feast. Very important to know that. Because if it is this evil time, December 25th or Kislev 25th, is this horrible, horrible time, and that it's the pagan ritual and all this stuff, well, here's Jesus celebrating it. So does that mean Jesus was following pagan ritual? I would guess not. That is, unless you don't believe in Jesus or you think that he's a fraud, then of course you'll throw anything that you want or anything that you can at him and say, hey, maybe it is. But any real Christian knows that Jesus didn't sin, therefore this couldn't have been something that's bad because he actually observed it. Now let's address the shepherds in the field men. The shepherds that received the visit the night of Jesus' birth were no ordinary shepherds, and the flocks they washed over were no ordinary flock. Bethlehem, which is five miles south of Jerusalem, is where the temple flocks and the herds were kept until they were needed for sacrifice in Jerusalem. The shepherd's field was actually something akin to a stockyard, where thousands of animals, many raised in the region, but many more imported from surrounding nations, well, they had to be inspected by trained priests, and those approved kept available for sacrifice. Sacrifices were offered up into the temple every day of the year, so animals for sacrifice would have been kept in the fields all year round. So right there is a myth that people would say is that the shepherds wouldn't be out there, but that's not true because we know that they were there because they did sacrifices all year round, therefore they would have had them. Now at the end of December, it sees the annual festival of lights. Today that's called Hanukkah, as we've gone over already. So there would have been a larger number of animals in the fields in the late December than in ordinary days. Also, sheep herding was one of the number of unclean trades. Now, rabbinic tradition considered that they were unclean, therefore all social intercourse with shepherds was banned. However, we see from the gospel that the shepherds of Bethlehem went freely around the village conversing with people and recounting the angelic visit and finding the baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and laying in a manger. This free social intercourse would have been prohibited had these been regular shepherds. But the shepherds of Bethlehem, who kept watch over the temple flocks, were not nomadic, but were able to not only take part in the religious life of the community, but were in fact an important part of the religious life, and therefore they were not under rabbinic ban. So this is further proof, and this completely destroys the myth that there were not shepherds in the field. There were always shepherds in the field in Jerusalem. Jerusalem is also not a very cold place. So the whole myth that they couldn't be out there, debunked. You'll also hear that the Puritans banned Christmas, and they said it was pagan. Therefore, it must be pagan, right? Well, the problem is, if you actually read the public notices that they put up, the part that was sacrilege was exchanging of gifts, greetings, dressing in fine clothing, feasting, and similar satanical practice. You see, the Puritans believed everything that was comfortable, everything that was nice, anything that made you happy was evil. Matter of fact, that's why they wore two-ton clothing. They wore black and white because anything with colors was satanic. They also chopped little notches in their seats and in their pews. That way it hurt your butt when you sat down. The reason they did that was because comfort was considered satanic. So taking their word for anything, probably not a good idea. In truth, most of the problems that people have with it are just that they don't want to be associated with the Catholic Church because a lot of atrocity propaganda has been waged against the Catholic Church. And plus there's a lot of new things that they've done that people disagree with. What they don't realize is that the Catholic Church has made a lot of changes. Obviously there was the Great Schism where the Catholic Church and the Greek Orthodox Church split from each other and that was in the 10th century. And why did they split? Because the Catholic Church started to change. Well, obviously that means that they were different. So to take what they are today and to try to compare that to what they were back then is kind of a fallacy of logic. We also have a growing number of what they call Hebrew roots movement. Now I call that Babylonian roots because they're not actually Hebrew roots. Everything that they do is the restoration of Babylon. They've gone back to the language of Babylon. They've gone back to the written word of Babylon. They've gone back to the rituals of Babylon. And so these people look at everything that's past Babylon as evil which I mentioned earlier. So I myself was fooled for a long time. I looked at everything for Christmas and I thought, well, this is this and this is that. Let me touch base really quick on St. Nicholas. Now St. Nicholas dates way back. He's one of the early church fathers. He was the Bishop of Myrna and he's been celebrated at least in the Western areas on December 6th, all the way up until the early 1900s. The US government decided that there were too many holidays all in one shot. So they forced that out and they moved St. Nicholas Day to December 25th to be put on the same time as Christmas. So the whole argument with Santa Claus, St. Nicholas, and all of that, once again, debunked because it's only recently that those were both put on the same days. And as we know, a lot of the mythology that people try to tie in with them doesn't exist prior to 
the earliest that we have on record of December 25th is the birth of Jesus Christ. So I'm not even really going to get into that part very much because I think it's irrelevant because it's so recent and it really doesn't have any merit in this conversation. Now I'm sure I've missed a few things here and there and I will probably make more videos kind of addressing little topics here and there and adding a little bit more to things. But for the sake of keeping this video a little bit shorter, uh, I'm going to be done with it for today. I hope you guys have all learned something. I know that me learning this stuff really changed my world because I have slowly started going back and finding out that all of these holidays that we have are actually very good things. And what's happened is, is atheists and Hebrew roots cultists have come in right around the 1900s and the early 2000s, and they have just demonized everything that we were and everything that we are. They have us hating ourselves. They have us hating our own things that we have done. And the truth is, we shouldn't be. Christmas is a beautiful time of year. The music is beautiful. People show love to one another. One of the best things about Christmas to me is just how everyone treats each other. Now, I've heard the argument that Christmas must be evil because it focuses on materialism. But materialism is something that other people do. To be honest with you, if you're focused on materialism during Christmas, you have a problem. As a Christian, you should be focusing on the birth of Jesus Christ. Now, we exchange gifts because the wise men brought gifts to Jesus. Now, of course, we assume that there's three wise men because there's three gifts. But the truth is we have no idea how many wise men there were. They brought gifts, and that's what we're doing. We are bringing gifts, and we're passing them to each other in remembrance of that. So let's kind of real quick and briefly go over what Christmas is and what the celebration is. On Christmas Eve, some people have a feast. Some people read the Christmas story. There's a lot of different uh, parts with that. And the reason is, is because the Jewish days started at sundown. Therefore, Christmas Eve, when the sun goes down, is technically Christmas Day. So that really depends on how you look at it. But we always have a feast on Christmas. And why do we have that feast? Because it is the Feast of Dedication. We have a tree and we decorate it like the Second Temple because we are using that as representation of Jesus, who is the descendant of Judah, who is the King of Kings, and who is the Christ and the Messiah. He is the temple of God in the flesh. So we honor Jesus by putting a tree and decorating it like the temple in Second Chronicles 3. The various ornaments that we put on are the colors of the stones that were put in the temple. The tinsel is gold and silver, which are the same colors as the material, which is gold and silver, as the chains that were put on. On the top, we put an angel. Now that is a representation of the cherubim. Now some people use the Star of Bethlehem, which is totally acceptable because that's a representation of the star that brought the wise men to Jesus. We exchange gifts, as I mentioned just before. We do that because of the kings. But most importantly, we get together and celebrate Jesus, which is something we should be getting together all the time for. But this is a really, really important time because it's time that we can dedicate ourselves for him, who is the light. So I want everyone to consider that the next time somebody bashes Christmas or the next time they tell you that you shouldn't do it because it's a pagan holiday, I'm actually going to be making videos with other holidays as well. So one last thing before we go, Romans 14, 5 and 7 says, One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regardeth that day regardeth unto the Lord. And he that regardeth not that day, to the Lord he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth thanks to God. And he that eateth not, to the Lord he eateth not, and giveth thanks to God. For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. And then in verse 8 and 9 it says, For whether we live, we live unto the Lord, and whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. This is Epiphany of Truth TV, and I thank you guys for bearing with me on this. And I wish you all a very, very Merry Christmas. God bless.